Hello and welcome to another eMath Instruction Common Core Algebra 1 lesson. I'm Kirk Weiler and today we're going to be doing Unit 7, Lesson Number 1, Introduction to Polynomials. Polynomials are going to form the basis of a lot of what we're going to be studying from now on in the course. So we want to get fluent with all sorts of different skills and just with the terminology involved. We're going to get a really good exposure to all of that today. As usual, let me remind you that you can get the worksheet and a homework that goes along with this video by clicking on the description. At the top right corner of every one of our worksheets is going to be one of these QR codes. Use a free app on your cell phone to simply scan this code and be taken right to this video. All right, let's get into it. Now, integers, we start a discussion about polynomials, believe it or not, with discussing integers. Integers are simply collections of powers of 10. Okay, so we're not talking fractions here. All right, we're talking about just plain integers. So, you know, we've got one unit, then we collect 10 of those and we have 10 units. Collect 10 of those, we have 100 units. Collect 10 of those, we have 1,000 units. So we have 10 to the first, that's 10, 10 to the second, 100, 10 to the third, 1,000, 10 to the fourth would be 10,000, 10 to the fifth would be 100,000, etc. All right, so when we're thinking about an integer, we can take a number like 563 in our first exercise, and we can really think of that as 5 100s plus 6 10s plus three ones, right? Now, I, I know this is very elementary work. I get that. But what we're building up to is we're building up to the notion of a polynomial, right? Five one hundred, six tens, three ones. So we can construct the number 563 by taking each one of these powers of 10, if you will, and combining them. Now, we can write them in a little bit more efficient form by saying that 100 is 10 squared, and of course 10 is 10 to the first, but then we can write this as 5 times 10 to the second plus 6 times 10 to the first plus 3. And keep in mind, all we're really doing here is collecting powers of 10. We have 5 100s, 6 10s, and 3 1s. That's it. But each one of those we kind of keep separate because they're their, they're their own beast. All right? So what we're going to do in exercise one is we're going to take each one of these numbers, and we've done the first one, 563, and we're going to rewrite them as powers of 10. So for instance, 274 can be thought of as 200 plus 70 plus 4, right? I mean, that's what it means. But 200 is 2 times 100. 70 is, of course, 7 times 10, and 4 is 4 times 1. I'm just going to leave it as 4. So I can say that that's 2 times 10 to the second plus 7 times 10 to the first plus 4, right? We can use the little dot, the little x, eh, whatever. It gets maybe longer, but no, less comp or no more complicated when we have a number like 3,842, right? That would be 3,000 plus another 800 plus another 40 plus another 2. So 3,000 is 3 times 10 to the third, right? 800 is 8 times 10 to the second. 40 is 4 times 10 to those first, and then we just have the 2. Notice, by the way, how the powers are descending on 10. Again, that's all we do. In our number system, we just keep counting these powers of tens. First ones, then tens, then the hundreds, then a thousands, then ten thousands, etc. Right? Why don't you pause the video and see if you can do the same thing that we just did for letter D? All right, let's go through it. 5,681 can be thought of as 5,000 plus 600 plus 80 plus 1. I keep really misstating this. I keep saying it can be thought of. No, it is that, right? It is 5,000 plus 600 plus 80 plus 1. The key now is, right, 5,000 is 5 thousands, right? 600 is 6 times 100. 80 is 8 times 10, and 1 is 1. But then that's 5 times 10 to the third plus 6 times 10 to the second plus 8 times 10 to the first, plus 1, 
right? Look at those powers descending. 10 to the third, 10 to the second, 10 to the first. And technically, if you really wanted to, 10 to the zero, right? Because 10 to the zero is just equal to one. But we tend to not write that. We can just keep making these numbers larger and larger and larger. And what that does is it basically dictates the highest power, right? 21,478. Let's do this one together, right? That's going to be 20,000 plus 1,000 plus 400 plus 70 plus 8, right? Now, that's a little bit trickier, right? But you can always figure out the power of 10 you're working with by counting how many zeros you have. So this is actually 2 times 10 to the 4th plus 1 times 10 to the 3rd plus 4 times 10 to the 2nd plus 7 times 10 to the 1st plus 8. All right, what I'd like you to do is pause the video and try letter F. That's going to be a long one. We might even have to reserve some extra space down here. But pause the video now. Take as much time as you need to. All right. So 200,000, This is actually a little bit tricky in a certain sense. I'm going to carve out some extra room. Not so much this part. Ooh, just got to make sure I got the right number of zeros. We have 200,000 plus 60,000 plus 3,000, right? Then we don't have any hundreds, which is a bit weird, and we'll see how that shows up, plus 30, plus 7. 20,000 would be 2 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10 to the 5th, right? Plus 6 times 1, 2, 3, 4, 10 to the 4th, plus 3 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3. Now, we're kind of expecting 100 here, but we don't have any of those. That's the brilliance of placeholders, right? That zero tells us that we have nothing in the hundreds column, so we'll just leave it out. We could, we could put in zero times 10 to the second. Most of the time we wouldn't, though. Probably just do this and like that, right? So not all the powers have to be present, and it's really this highest power that dictates basically everything. Now, you might think, why are we doing this? This, this, this feels like fourth grade work, fifth grade work, maybe tops. You know, maybe when you throw those exponents in, it gets to be high school level, or at least seventh or eighth grade. Well, this is going to lead us into defining what's known as a polynomial. So I'm going to scrub out the text. Take a moment if you need to. Okay, here it goes. Let's figure out what a polynomial is. Now, we're going to do one of these exercises one more time. Take a look at letter A. What I'd like you to do is do this on your own. It says, just letter A. As in problem number one, write the number 63,735 as the sum of multiples of powers of 10. So please do that. All right, let's go through it really quick. All right, I have 60,000, another 3,000, another 700, a 30, and a 5. So that's going to be 6 times 10 to the 4th plus 3 times 10 to the third, plus 7 times 10 squared, plus 3 times 10 to the first, plus 5. Now, here comes the connection. Here we go to polynomials. In our number system, the base is 10. But we could kind of generalize and say, well, we don't, we don't need to have a 10 there. We, we could have any number. Maybe we have x there. So in fact, let, let's just say that x and 10 are the same thing. If x is 10, write this number, this thing, in terms of an equivalent expression involving x. Well, one of the beautiful things about equality is if I tell you that two things are equal, you can just replace one with the other. So I'm going to just switch over real quick to red. Let's just take this term, 6 times 10 to the fourth. All right, if I were to write that in terms of x, and x is 10, then that's going to be 6x to the fourth, right? 10, x, they're the same thing. If I move on to the next term, that would be 3 times x to the third. Then I have 7 times x to the second. 3 times x to the first, I'm going to leave the first off, and then plus 5. Now, of course, this expression 
has a value that depends on x. Right now, x is 10, and if x is 10, this expression is 63,735. That's the point. But x could be anything, and this leads us to what are known as polynomials. Okay? And in fact, what we just wrote down was a polynomial, right there. It's kind of a cool little beast. Um, I'm going to scrub out the text. I'm going to get rid of this, and then we're going to introduce poly... Well, actually, I think I'll, I'll keep the text there for just a moment. Let's, let's introduce the definition of a polynomial now, <laughs> now, that, it's, now that I've got the, uh, the text on top of the polynomial box. We'll get rid of that, go back to our pen. So, wow, you know how sometimes definitions in math, you can look at them and go, let's take a look at this one. Any expression of this form, a times x to the n plus b times x to the n minus 1 plus c times x to the n minus 2 plus dot dot dot, meaning the pattern is continuing indefinitely, plus a constant, no x, where the exponents n, n minus 1, n minus 2, etc. are all positive integers. They have to be positive integers. Integers meaning whole numbers, no fractions. And positive, well, meaning positive, not negative, not zero. It says, note that not all powers need to be present because some of the coefficients, a, b, c, could be zero, right? Think about that number where we didn't have the hundreds, all right? So this is a classic case of a polynomial, right? All the powers are positive integers, even down here to a power of one, we have a constant added on at the end. It's a polynomial. Simple enough, right? So let's take a look and see whether we can identify polynomials or not. So once you've introduced something in math, you have to make sure you can recognize it. You know, it's kind of like if, if you're a wildlife biologist. As soon as you know what a, uh, a groundhog is, you, you have to be able to, to recognize it. All right, take a look at exercise number three. Of the expressions shown below, circle all of them that represent polynomials. Discuss why the ones that aren't polynomials fail the definition above. Okay, so see if you can recognize a polynomial right now. You may not be able to, that's okay. Pause the video and circle ones that you think are polynomials. Ones that you don't think are polynomials, explain why, or at least have a reason in your head. Okay, pause the video now. All right. Let's go through it. I'm going to just start by circling the polynomials. Whoops, or making a random blue mark. All right, here's a polynomial. Here's a polynomial. Textbook example. We've got coefficients, right? Those are the numbers multiplying the variables, 4, 8, 1. All right, take a look at the powers, x to the second, x to the first, all whole numbers. That's good. Same thing here, x to the second, x to the third, x to the first, right? Nobody says it has to be written in order, all right? Polynomials don't have to be written in order, although we'll get to what's known as their standard form in a moment. But let's take a look at the two that aren't polynomials. For instance, this is definitely not a polynomial. Now, probably most people, if they said it wasn't a polynomial, it's because of this term. Let's understand why. That is technically x to the minus 1. That's what that is. 1 over x, remember negative exponents. 1 over x and x to the minus 1 are the same. So technically speaking, right, this is a negative exponent, which does not fit into the definition of a polynomial. This is also not a polynomial, because with polynomials, the bases, remember, these are the base, the bases have to be variable. Bases must be variable, and the powers must be constants. And here our powers are variable, right? So in fact, what this is, is it's just the sum of a bunch of exponential functions, which we saw back in unit number six, okay? So let's keep going. I'm going to scrub out the text, and then we'll do a little polynomial manipulation. Got it? All right, let's move on. <clears throat> the next thing that we're going to do is talk about the standard form of a polynomial. You see, it's important for us to be able to look at polynomials and identify the coefficients on the highest term. That's called the 
leading coefficient and be able to identify coefficients as those terms decrease in power from, you know, let's say x to the fifth, x to the fourth, x to the third, etc. All right? So standard form of a polynomial is rearranging it so the highest power comes first along with its coefficient, then the next highest power along with its coefficient, etc. Some powers could be missing, quote unquote, that's okay, that's no problem. Um, but they have to be rearranged so that the powers decrease. That's standard form. Powers decrease. That's a very important piece of terminology, standard form. Make sure you understand that. Rearranging the terms of a polynomial so they decrease. Make sure you even understand what I mean by a term, right? A term is something separated by addition or subtraction. So these are all polynomial terms, okay? So let's do it. Let's take a look at exercise number four. Write each one of the polynomials in standard form. Let's take a look at the first one and see what's, what's good about it and what's not good. All right, we've got 3x squared plus 5x cubed plus 7 minus 8x. All right, we have to write it in terms of decreasing terms. Now, you know that you can rearrange addition all over the place because it's what's known as associative and commutative. When you have some subtraction involved, like we do on the negative 8x, or on the subtraction of the 8x, sorry, getting ahead of myself, it might start to get a little confusing. What I always tell my students is if you're confused at all about subtraction, and this is a really good idea, rewrite it as adding an opposite. So in other words, 3x squared plus 5x cubed plus 7 plus negative 8x now is pretty easy. Here's my highest powered term. Right, I'm going to write that down first, 5x cubed. This is my next highest powered term, 3x squared. This is my next highest powered term. And here's my last one. Now, most of the time, we're not going to leave it like this. We're going to write it as 5x cubed plus 3x squared minus 8x plus 7. And there we go. In other words, that subtraction on the negative 8x follows it. It comes with it. Okay. Why don't you try letter B and letter C? These aren't too challenging, but give them a shot. See what you come up with, and then we'll go through them. All right, let's do it. 9x to the fourth, 2x to the first, negative x squared, positive 1. All right, highest power? 9x to the fourth. Leading coefficient, 9. All right, negative x squared. That thing is coming with it, right? Positive 2x. That positive is coming with it, plus 1. Okay, let's take a look at the last one. Highest powered term right here. Bring that negative with it. Negative 5x squared. Next highest, minus 2x. Last plus 3. Polynomials in their standard form. Again, notice, you don't always have to have all powers present. In this particular polynomial, letter B, we were missing an x cubed. If you want to, you could think about it as having 0 x cubed. right? That would sort of be the equivalent of having a number like, let's say, 90,000. Um, well, the negative in there throws me off a bit. Let's say that was a positive, 121. Let's say that was a positive here. Um, that would be the equivalent of this, and we would just be missing the, uh, the thousands term. Okay, I am going to clear out this text, so pause the video now. Okay, here we go. Moving on. The next thing we want to make sure that we can do in this lesson, and it'll be the last thing that we practice, is making sure we can add polynomials together. Polynomials add just like integers do. So we're going to start by doing what we did before. It says, consider 523 and 271. Write each as the sum of multiples of powers of 10 as done previously before. So I'm going to do it for 523, then I'm going to ask that you do it for 271. So 523, right, is 500 plus 20 plus 3. So that's 5 times 10 squared plus 2 times 10 to the first plus 3. You do it for 271. 
Okay. All right, let's go through it. 200 plus 70 plus 1 gives me 2 times 10 to the second plus 7 times 10 to the first plus 1. Now, letter B says add these numbers by adding each individual power of 10. Now, just for a minute, I know many of you are probably saying, look, man, I, I don't need anything special to add these. I just add these by going 3 plus 1 is 4, 2 plus 7 is 9, 5 plus 2 is 7, and I'd get 794. But look, what you're really doing when you do that is you're saying, all right, I've got 3, I've got 1, I've got 4. Right, you're adding your 1s. Then you're having two tens and seven tens, and what are you getting? You're getting nine tens, right? Then you have five hundreds and two hundreds, so you're getting seven hundreds. So you're literally adding how many hundreds you have. You're adding how many tens you have. And you're adding how many ones you have. And then, of course, you're just writing it as 794, okay? But the beautiful thing is that we can just directly apply this to letter C. If I've got 5x squared plus 2x plus 3, it's no different. It's just like I have 523, right? 2x squared plus 7x plus 1, that's like having 271. So if I add these together, I can add the 3s and I'll get 4. I can add the x's and I'll get 9x. And I can add the x squareds and I'll get 7x squared. But the big difference between letter B and letter C is here's where I have to stop. Right? I just have to stop there. There's nothing more I can do. All right? But what we're really doing here is a process of combining like terms. All right? And you've done this before. Combining like terms, especially when we did our linear work, right? Except here, we're always going to combine things that have the same powers. So we'll be able to combine x squareds. We'll be able to combine x cubes. We'll be able to combine x to the fourth because we're just going to keep track of how many we have, right? That is no different than when we add normal integers. We're just keeping track of how many hundreds we have, how many tens we have, how many ones we have, etc. Right? So let's take a look at letter D. It says find the sum of the polynomials negative 4x squared plus 8x minus 3 and 7x squared minus 5x plus 4. Now again, for some people, the subtraction really might be a little bit tricky. So perhaps it's best to think of this as a negative 4x squared, a positive 8x, and a negative 3. As well, a positive 7x squared, a negative 5x, and a positive 4. Because now when I add these together, and I'm going to be very careful, I just think, well, I've got negative 4x squareds and positive 7x squareds. So on the whole, I have positive 3x squareds. I have a positive 8x and a negative 5x. So on the whole, I have a positive 3x. Lots of 3s here, apparently. I have a negative 3 and a positive 4. And on the whole, that's going to be a positive 1. Right? And that's it. So I combine like terms by keeping track of how many x squareds I have, how many x to the first I have, how many constants I have. Okay, we're going to clear this out. Then we're going to look at some subtraction. Subtraction is always harder. Pause the video if you need to. Okay, here we go. Okay, last page. Subtraction is tough. All right, subtraction is often very, very difficult. Um, and let, let's take a look why. Okay, here we've got 6x squared plus 5x plus 3 minus 2x squared negative 4x plus 7. Now, most people wouldn't have a hard time with the first part of the problem. They'd say 6x squared minus 2x squared, well, that'll just give me 4x squared. That's easy. But here is where people will mess up. Because what we really have here is 5x minus negative 4x. That's what we really have. Now, if you recall, whenever we subtract a negative, it is the equivalent of adding the opposite. So what we really have here is a positive 9x. Same thing here. Some people would definitely have a problem here, but I'd have 3 minus 7, 
And of course, that would leave me with a negative 4. So subtraction can be much, much more difficult than addition. In fact, if we look at letter B, right, maybe the easiest thing to do on this is what a lot of teachers will refer to as distributing a negative. Now, I really want you to understand. The parentheses around this first trinomial, this first quadratic, they're really irrelevant. What we're really doing in a certain sense is taking this, changing the subtraction into an addition, and then multiplying everything by negative 1. What this will allow me to do is actually get rid of these parentheses. In other words, if I distribute that negative 1, let's be careful, negative 1 times negative 2 is positive 2. Negative 1 times positive 1 is negative 1, and negative 1 times negative 3 is positive 3. Notice how all the signs changed. All signs switched. That will always happen when you distribute a negative through a parenthesis, a negative 1 that is. And now look what we can do. We can say we've got a positive 4x squared, a positive 2x squared, together that's a positive 6x squared. Let's be careful. We have negative x to the 2x to the first, negative 1x to the first. In total, we have negative 3x to the first. We have a positive 7 and a positive 3. Together, we have a positive 10. Okay. Oftentimes, when you subtract a polynomial, it's much better to distribute the subtraction, change the signs on everything, and then add. Let's look at the absolute last problem. I want you to look at A, I want you to look at B, pause the video, look at them carefully, and see if you can tell me what the difference is between the two. All right, let's take a look. Letter A, I don't want to say it's an addition problem, but it's definitely just a combination problem. We're just combining like terms, right? So we're saying we've got 6x squared, negative 1x squared, that's a positive 5x squared. We have a positive 2x, we have a positive 4x, that's a positive 6x. We have a negative 3 and a negative 1, in total that's a negative 4. On the other hand, look at letter B. They look almost identical, but notice the parentheses that are suddenly here, right? What we're going to want to do in this situation is go with an approach that's very similar to letter B. We're going to distribute that negative through the parentheses, and I'm going to do that right away. I'm going to do that always by changing the sign on everything. So that positive 1x squared became negative, positive 4x became negative 4x, negative 1 became positive 1. Now watch what's going to happen. 6x squared minus x squared, 5x squared. Positive 2x, negative 4x on the whole is a negative 2x. And a negative 3 and a positive 1 is a negative 2. Look at the difference between these two. The original problem seems so similar, and yet the answers turned out to be fairly different. I know they both have the 5x squared in them, but that's about it. We really have to understand, we do not want to distribute multiplication, including multiplying by negative 1, unless there are parentheses there. If there are, distribute through that negative 1, and it'll make that subtraction a lot easier. Oops. I'm going to clear out the text. And then we'll finish up. All right. Well, that was our first lesson on polynomials. And what have we seen? We've seen that polynomials act a lot like integers, right? They're, they have these decreasing powers on x. They have coefficients. They add like integers do. When I add a polynomial to a polynomial, I get another polynomial. In future lessons, we're going to find out how to multiply polynomials. We'll leave division to algebra 2, though. All right, we'll even learn how to unmultiply polynomials, what's known as factoring. Okay, but for now, that's been Unit 6, Lesson Number 1 from eMath Instruction. I'm Kirk Weiler, and until next time, keep thinking and keep solving problems.